Hey guys, in this video, I'm going to give you the data that I looked at to come up with my conclusion that we were going to have a red tsunami on Tuesday. And then I'm going to show you the data that I found that showed why I was wrong. But then I'm going to show you the data why I'm very hopeful for our future as a republic. Um, but first off, I want to start with a quote from a man I love. We need to participate for the common good. Sometimes we hear a good Catholic is not interested in politics. This is not true. Good Catholics immerse themselves in politics by offering the best of themselves so that the leader can govern. Did you hear that? Good Catholics immerse themselves in politics. That quote is from Pope Francis. Pope Francis says, good Catholics immerse themselves in politics, which is good news for me because I cannot help but immerse myself in politics. Um, and this is why we've had phenomenal, the best, the top political scholars on this show. Uh, Dr. Robert P. George, uh, Dr. Alan Keyes, Dr. Francis Beckwith. I don't think there's smarter guys in political science in those three. And uh, Lord Willem will have him back on to talk about this, this election. But I also know we do not fight against flesh and blood, but we fight against spiritual principalities. At the root of this evil of our political opposition is the devil. This is why I've had exorcist priest on um, Father Vincent Lampart. I've had very spiritual priests like my priest, Father Derek. Uh, I always get his last name wrong. So, Father, if you're watching, it's Saladanaha. <laughs> my sons are always correcting me. I uh, apologize. But Father Derek is a great priest, a holy priest. I also have another great priest, Father Fidel. Uh, speaks really broken English. Uh, so, I don't know if I, I'm going gonna, gonna to try and get him on, but, we'll, you know, Lord willing, we'll work that one out. But I also know. Pope Francis has repeated previous popes. On several occasions, I've heard Pope Francis say, the vocation of the church is evangelization. We are called to evangelize. Dogs bark because they bark. Catholics evangelize because we're Catholics. So I've done my best to get the best apologists I can find. And I think I got the two best uh, We've interviewed Dr. Scott Hahn, and we've interviewed uh, Steve Ray. I don't know two better. So I say all this because I want to encourage you, if you haven't subscribed and you like this channel, please subscribe. Because uh, I've been striking out lately. <laughs> I've been trying to get people on the show. So, you know, I know people are busy and they have to choose which shows they go on. You know, they want to do the most for the kingdom of God. So if they can talk to 50,000 Subscribers versus 13,000, they're going to go there. There's, you know, just common sense. So please subscribe and like. They tell me the more likes, the better the algorithm, so they go out to more people. I don't know. And if you really like this channel and you want to support me, uh, when I was a milkman, I got laid off uh, during uh, the pandemic, and my son set up a, a uh, Patreon account. So just, I guess it's Patreon, Blue Collar Catholic. You could donate. Uh, but that's, you know... I, I don't talk about it much because I kind of feel funny because most people are like, you know, they'll give me two sets of Ginsu knives and a free DVD if you sign up. A signed book from me. I have nothing to offer. <laughs> I have my Patreons get the same as my non Patreons. They're just blessing me. So uh, I don't have to go back to being a milkman because milkman, I made really good money, you know, for a blue collar guy. For what I do, I, I sell and I deliver. It's called route sales delivery. You know, I drive a truck, so you gotta, you know, you gotta know how to drive a truck, but you gotta know how to talk to people and sell. So it's a, it's a pretty cool job. I like it. But in that field, milkmen get paid the best because, you know, you wake up at midnight, you clock in at one in the morning, and you're slinging heavy cases all day uh, to like four in the afternoon. It's, you know, pretty brutal work. It's like 70 to 80 hours of work a week. And uh, I make less videos when I do that. So. Keeping me from this job, you know, this job is still like a 12 hour day, but it's not as hard. And, uh, you know, that little extra I get from Patreon and, you know, I'm so bad with Patreon. I'm, I'm really not a tech guy. I'm just, you know, I'm just like an old school guy, <laughs> you know, 
I'm really not good with uh, the tech. So, so I used to like always write a big thank you and talk to my uh, uh, patrons through Patreon, but they changed it now and I can't even reply. People send me money and I can't even say thank you. So I'm saying you thank you now. And if you want to talk to me, just a lot of my uh, patrons will just email me at blue collar at Gmail. You know, a lot of non patrons do too. And, you know, I try and respond to everybody. I don't always do, you know, because, you know, it's busy sometimes, but I always try and respond. Um, and like I said, you'll get nothing out of it. <laughs> so, so if you're well off, you have extra money and you want to keep this thing going, uh, that'll help, you know, and, uh, um, you know, that's all I can say about that. Um, so now getting, getting to the, uh, why I was wrong about the red wave. So I've been following politics since Ronald Reagan beat Jimmy Carter. And I just read a lot. You know, back in the day, it was books. It was magazines. I used to get like, you know, I used to, you know, for a penny, you can get 20 subscriptions and then it would bill you and I would never pay them. I, I'm not saying that's right. You should do it. But as a teenager, that's how I got all these political magazines. And, you know, I was a political nerd. I was a juvenile delinquent slash political nerd. I was a pretty unique animal as a teenager. But... What I've learned over the years is the best way to tell if there's going to be a wave is look at the generic polls. So what a generic poll does is um, they just ask you who are you more likely to vote for, Republicans or Democrats. They don't go into specific races. And historically, and this has always been the case with every election cycle in my lifetime, if it's even, the Republicans win overall. If the Republicans are up by like two points, they have a blowout. They have a wave. Because I, I guess most polls skewed during, towards uh, Democrats to make the Democrats look better to the average person. But even like the good polls that are scientific, they poll more Democrats because there's more registered Democrats in this country than Republicans. So if I see an even generic poll, I'm like, yeah, we're going to win. I feel confident. If I see we're up by two or three points, I'm like, yeah, it's going to be a slaughter. Well, all polls are not created equal. That's another thing I found. The most accurate polls in my lifetime have always been Trafalgar and Rasmussen. And the mainstream media doesn't like to quote these polls because they claim they're conservative because they've worked for conservatives, uh, you know. But they're accurate. They're always accurate. Trafalgar was the only poll that... Uh, said Trump was going to win in 2016. This is how accurate they are. Uh, and so the media being 90, I think the latest from like 1980, it's always been like at 90%, but I think the latest Pew poll, 98% of the media, you know, ABC, NBC, CBS have never voted for a Republican. So even when they're not right out lying, if they're trying to be honest, the people they trust are on the left. So for example, most of you guys never heard of Thomas Sowell or Walter Williams. These guys are very old now, but through my lifetime, these have been two of the smartest scholars that I've listened to on all different economic issues, political issues. They happen to be African-Americans, but they happen to be conservative. So the news will never go to them for their point of view on, say, racial issues. Instead, they'll go to liberals they trust that are African-Americans like Al Sharpton and Jesse Jackson and get the liberal slant on it. Same thing with polls. They won't go to the conservative polls, even though they're better. They've been proven better time and time again. Well, Rasmussen and Trafalgar had the generic poll Republicans up by five. I was like, whoa, this is going to be a red tsunami. Then in addition to that, the polls were showing that suburban women voted 12% more for Biden just two years ago or voting 15% more for Republicans. A 27 point uh Change. I mean, this is cataclysmic for Democrats. This is huge that suburban women were going to vote Republicans in such large numbers. Add to that, the polling on Hispanics was showing they were coming over in huge numbers to the Republican parties. And blacks, even though it was in huge numbers, it was huge compared to history. Like 27 to 30% of blacks said they were going to vote Republicans. Usually, the Democrats have a lock. They have get 95% of vote. We're lucky to get more than 5%. I think Trump got the most as president. He got like 10%. So I'm like, whoa, the black vote, 
the Hispanic vote, the suburban vote, these generic polls. And then just from anecdotal, all these people moving down from New Jersey and New York because they're fed up with the liberals up there, how to destroy their state were different than in the past when I first moved down. And when I first moved down, people moved down because it was cheaper to live and they liked the climate, but they were still voting Democrat. And I used to argue with them or debate, dialogue, like, what are you doing? You're going to ruin our state like you guys ruined your states. You know, when I came to Florida because I hated Jersey politics, you know, and I voted Floridian, you know, Florida's vote Republican. We're solidly red. So anyway, this, these new Yankees coming down understood that. And they loved the chance they were coming down because you have, they were telling me you have the best government in the governor of the state. Our governors had our schools shut down for years, you know, totally unscientific, you know. Florida did much better than any state of its size. Um, anyway, so it was those figures. And then crime, these liberal Democrats just, their policies are direct, the, the crime is a direct result. They try and, and turn and say, oh, red states are just as violent. No, when you take away the blue cities in the red states, our crime rate is at the bottom. Jersey, New York, California, Illinois, these Democrat states, their crime rate's through the roof because of their policies. So you could beat someone, get charged with attempted murder, and get released the same day without bail. It's called cashless bail. All the Democrats are doing it. It's the, it's the new craze. Cashless bail. It's fair. It's equitable. Well, in New York City, this woman had on video. She brought it to the cops. I've seen the video. Her ex was beating the crap out of her. I mean, beating her brutally. He didn't stop beating her until he got out of breath. Bloody, battered, showed the video. She said, I know for a fact if he comes out, he's going to kill me. Cash this bail. The Democrats want to be fair. They let him out the same day. This woman got herself a bulletproof vest. He killed her execution style in the head right in front of her children. So I knew people were seeing the lunacy on the left. The left has just become... You know, we used to debate ideas. Now we just debate Saturday. They're just insane. So I seen that and I was like, I knew we were going to have a red wave. And I guess I got excited with our red wave. I mean, we just annihilate. I mean, it was just like unbelievable what we did here in Florida. Unbelievable. But so I thought everybody was feeling that way. So, um, oh, and then you look where the money is. Uh, you look where the money is. I usually don't do notes, but there's so much I want. I don't want to miss. I'm going to do a little notes today. You, usually I just say what I mean, mean what I say, and try not to say it mean. And then I holy ghost it and post it. I just pray over it and post it and, you know, all the mistakes and stuff are in there. But I don't want to make any mistakes today. Um, so I got some notes. <laughs> uh, so where was I? Oh, then you watch where the money's going. The Democrats spent 80% of their money defending seats and 20% trying to flip seats. Republicans were the opposite. We spent 20% of our money defending seats that we thought were in jeopardy and 80% to flip seats. Plus the fact we've had a lot of immigrants. And again, maybe I was just too focused on Florida. A lot of immigrants from Venezuela and South America. And they're, they're as Republican as the Cuban Americans because they see the Democrats, what they are, are socialist fascists, like the socialist fascists in Venezuela they're running from. So I seen all that and um, I was like, yeah, this is going to be a red tsunami like never before. And I said, we're going to get 53 seats in the Senate. Well, what went wrong? <laughs> before I get into the data, I'm just going to say this. I would have never thought in a million years Pennsylvania would have voted for Fetterman. Not because he had a stroke and he could barely talk, but he's the most left-wing extreme candidate that ran ever around here. And I didn't think Pennsylvania would go for such a left-winger. I mean, this guy, he not only does he want cashless bail, like I just explained, all the Democrats want. He said he wants to let out half of the prisoners in Pennsylvania. Every murderer he wants to let out. This is what he wants. This is what the guy said. And... He's such a fraud, a fake, and a phony. He goes around in a hoodie like he's a blue-collar guy. This guy's a rich trust fund baby who never worked, never worked. Lived with his parents until his 40s and then got jobs in politics where he really never worked. <laughs> so this guy's a fraud. I would have never thought in a million years he would have won. But then when I seen Tony DeLuca win, I was like, I guess that explains it. 
If you don't know who Tony DeLuca is, Tony DeLuca is a Democrat congressman that won on Tuesday, got won by 70 points. And he's dead. Tony DeLuca is dead. He died a year ago. I'm sorry. He died a month ago and they didn't have time to take his name off the ballot. So that shows me when the Democrats go in the vote, they just vote Democrat. They don't even look at the name. They don't even think about the person. Well, this guy had a stroke. He could barely talk. He wants end fracking. Uh, he wants end drilling. And that's like a half a, a million jobs that he'll, we'll get rid of in Pennsylvania. They don't think about anything about the guy. Just he's a Democrat. I mean, they voted for Tony DeLuca. By, he won by 70 points, and he's been dead for a month. So that shows you, we got to be more like the Democrats. We look at each person. I don't like his character. Oh, he's a little mean. He tweets a little funny. No, you got to vote for your team. Whether you like the new coach or not, you got to vote for your team. The pro-life team is the Republican team. That should be every Catholic's team. So what else did I get wrong? This is the biggie. Listen up. You heard it at Blue Collar Catholic first. The Gen Z generation came out to vote. That's the under 30 came out and voted like 400% more than they normally do. Now, don't get too worried because the under 30 group is always very liberal and they always say they're going to vote and the Democrats are always pushing for the vote, but they usually don't get it because they usually end up going to a party or watching a DVD and not going to, they never took it important. This time, the under 30 vote came out and voted. And, you know, again, quoting the great scholar that was on the show, Robert P. George. Well, actually, I said a quote that I thought was attributed to uh, Winston Churchill. And he said, no, now scholars don't think it was him, but we don't know who, who did it. So just, you can say it's Winston Churchill. But, um, uh, Ronald Reagan used to say it all the time, and he used to quote Winston Churchill, that if you're 20 and you're not a liberal, you have no heart. If you're 40 and you're not a conservative, you have no brain. <laughs> so the young tend to be liberal because they haven't lived life. They haven't experienced it. They, they like all these fancy ideas uh, on the left that in reality, once they live a life, they realize they don't make sense. But now more than ever, they're just totally insane. Even liberals like Bill Maher and Joe Rogan are saying that the you know, left has gone loony. You know, these are liberals. This is why we have a lot of liberals coming over. Um, but they also fell because the under 30 crowd right now is being so indoctrinated in college by their Marxist professors. And these not subtly, you know, these, you know, I, I told you this before, my kids all went to college and they show me their professor's Facebooks. And these guys are quoting Mao, Stalin, Lenin, Marx. These guys are, are, are communists. And they're being indoctrinated. I say they're being indoctrinated because they're not taught how to think. They're not taught critical thinking skills like we taught our kids when we homeschooled them. No, they're taught what to think. What to think. This is why they hate free speech because... They hear someone saying something that they were taught was bad speech, so they shut them down. So they were taught Republicans are evil. Republicans are evil. So they were so susceptible. A lot of us, a lot of experts actually were like, like why are the Democrats, Joe Biden and the media repeating the Democrats' lies like they do, keep saying democracy is our greatest threat. Democracy is on the line. Go vote in a Democratic election because democracy is on the line, <laughs> which makes no sense if you really think about it. But democ why were they saying this? Demo no one's going to fall for that crap. Democracy is on the line. You just seen Joe Biden yesterday saying, yeah, it looks like the Republicans are going to win the House. You know, I called Kevin uh, McCarthy. We'll work together. He wasn't saying, oh, my God, democracy's over. The Republicans won. <laughs> it, was, it was just a fake. And most people knew it was a fake. It was just rhetoric. But why did they spend so much time in their last couple days? Because they had to get the young vote out. I, and I hate to say it, but these ill-informed, useful idiots of the Democrat Party, Generation Z, that was never taught how to think, but what to think. And they were taught, we're bad. And Biden's telling them, the bad people are going to take over and it's going to be the end of democracy. So that motivated Gen Z to vote. Also, Gen Z were taught they're entitled. Remember, these are communists teachers in their in their colleges they're taught they're entitled joe biden said i'm going to give you ten thousand dollars for your college and some of you are going to get twenty thousand and these these mean republicans 
want to take it from you. If they get in charge, they're taking it. You're not getting that. But keep us in, wink, wink, and we'll give you even more. You know, AOC and the Communist Squad are talking about 50000 Bernie Sanders just wants to give it all back. <laughs> so they're like, we got a better chance with the Democrats of not paying for school, and we're entitled. Those hardworking blue-collar guys that never went to college got to pay for my college are those medical doctors and lawyers that busted their butt to pay back their student loans. They got to pay for my college. So that was another motivating factor. And also I noticed with the young generation, they're very ill-informed, not only about politics and life, but about science. They really are not taught how to critically think about science. So to them, the unborn child is not a baby. You know, most of them never had kids, so they didn't see an ultrasound that, yeah, that's a baby. You know, there's no, you know, they're just thinking of it as some tissue and it's my right to kill that baby. Or they won't say baby, like eliminate that pregnancy. So they made abortion a big issue. And the abortion, uh, the abortion lobby spent $500 million, a half a billion dollars, just bombarding the Republicans with negative ads. You know, and like I said in my last video, we got to do a better part. So if you're buying or selling real estate, you need to go to realestateforlife.org and give your money to a pro-life company. Stop giving these woke uh, companies that are supporting abortion your money. Seriously, realestateforlife.org if you're buying or selling real estate. So, um, so you had all that money, you know, and the Bible's interesting. Job says, Job 12, 12 says, uh, wisdom belongs to the aged and understanding to the old. These young Democrats think us old guys are stupid. They're not going to listen to us. So that was another reason we lost. I did not count on that young vote coming out. If you told me under 30 crowd would vote 400% more, I would have said, whoa, we're in trouble. Uh, and I don't think Trafalgar, Rasmussen, or any poll figured that was going to happen. They just counted these guys out you know, AWOL like they always are. Um, so, so we had the, so, so we lost the young vote because the Democrats talking point that the media just parroted their talking points, democracy's under fire. What are we going to do if these people don't concede? Every Republican, hey, here's a fact for you that you're not going to hear on CNN. Every Republican that lost conceded. They called. Every, every race that was called, and, and their state said this race is called, the Republican didn't waste time, called, and said congratulations to the Democrat who beat them. Most everybody on the Democrat did that except one. So the one person that hasn't conceded yet is a Democrat running for senator in Wisconsin against Ron Johnson. Mandela Barnes, probably the only guy as far left and radical as Fetterman in this race, he refused to concede. So you're not hearing about that. There's a Republican refu uh, Democrat refusing to concede. But that's the only one conceding. So democracy was at stake, but the Republicans won. And democracy is still as strong as ever. And Joe Biden was in the best mood. If he really thought that democracy was in, he didn't plan any press conference yesterday. And then when he seen they didn't get the tsunami that we all expected, that their Hail Mary passed to get the young vote out worked, he came out full of smiles. He, I've never seen Biden so happy as I did yesterday. So if he really believed what he was lying about, democracy was at risk, he wouldn't be smiling. So again, like I said, the pro-abortion companies spent half a billion dollars. The pro-abortion lobby spent half a billion dollars. And overall, they outspent us. Overall, they outspent. Don't believe this, been We were outspent. Marco Rubio was outspent three to one. And he was one of our, our stars that we were really supporting. There are other people outspent 10 to one. On average, the average Republican that was running was outspent four to one. So we got to do a better job of supporting our side financially. Um, and then, you know, the media, my whole life has been liberal. You know, Pew polls have shown it my whole life, and and you see their bias. But this last election cycle, they just literally repeated whatever the Democrats said. You, if you heard a Democrat say democracy is at stake, you know you could turn on ABC, CBS, NBC, CNN, MSNBC, 
and you would hear a reporter, so-called journalist, saying democracy is at stake. So we got the, we had the media against us, had big tech against us. All the celebrities are against us because it's cool to be a lib in Hollywood and in sports and in and in uh, music. So we had all that going against us. All that going against us, and I actually have good news. The good news is we are going to win the House. We're not going to get, what I say, 245 seats. I think we're going to get like 225 seats. We're going to have a bigger majority than the Democrats have for the past two years. And it looks like we're going to win the Senate without the runoff in Georgia. And we'll win the runoff in Georgia. So you still have outstanding votes in Nevada and Arizona, which is ridiculous because Florida is way bigger than both of those states. And we have all our votes counted before midnight last uh, Tuesday night. They could do it if they wanted to. But in Arizona, it looks like uh, our senator is losing if you look at the percentage. He's down by like 80,000 um, 80, votes. But there's 600,000 votes outstanding. And they just have to be, happen to be from the most Republican county. Uh, and the reason they're outstanding is because they ran out of ink. And they had to send people away. People had to come back. And you know where the people had to go to vote? They had to drive to a liberal county because for some reason they didn't forget to put the ink in the machines in the liberal counties. And funny thing, guess who's in charge of making sure the, you know, in charge of the elections, making sure there's enough ink is a woman named Katie Hobbs. She's a woman running for governor against Carrie Lake. So a Democrat running for governor who under, if she had any morals, she would have recused herself. Carrie Lake asked her to recuse herself. She refused. She's state attorney, so she's in charge of elections. She's the one that screwed up. And there's 600,000 votes that have not been counted yet. And based, just based on uh, the votes that we did get, and we always do historically from that county, uh, Carrie Lake and uh, the guy's name, the senator, escapes me now, Blake Masters, uh, They'll get enough votes to win. So Carrie Lake will be the governor. I picked her to win. Uh, she'll win. She'll be the governor. Big upset there. Uh, and Blake Masters will be centers. So that'll give us 50 to 48 in the Senate. And then Nevada, um, Adam Laxalt, I think his name is, Republican senator, is up by like th two, almost three points. And the outstanding counties, again, are Republican counties that they're just taking forever to count. And I, I, it just blows my mind. They're like third world countries. When you have Florida, way bigger. We knew and nobody questioned it. They knew they were secure. They knew they were accurate. And we had Florida, the third largest state in the country, done and counted. I think by 11 o'clock it was called, if I'm not mistaken. So it kind of makes people suspicious, you know. But we have enough eyes. We have enough lawyers. I think... They're going to count the votes and Adam Laxall will win. So that will give us 51 to 48. Now, Herschel Walker and Raphael Warnock in Georgia have to go to a runoff because in Georgia, if you don't get more than 50, if no one gets more than 50% of the vote, the top two candidates go to a runoff December 6th. And I'm confident Herschel will win that because there was a libertarian in there that took 2% of the vote. And I don't know any libertarian second choice would be a radical liberal socialist like Raphael and Warnock. So that 2% will go to Herschel Walker and Herschel Walker win. So we'll win 52 to 48. So technically I only missed it by, <laughs> by one, one Senate seat. But I really did think the House would win by a lot more. So um, so that's the good news. And actually there's, there's more good news. Uh, we've seen in Florida the future of the Republican Party, and I submit to you the future of the Republic, Ron DeSantis. Ron DeSantis annihilated Charlie Crist, a former popular Republican governor who switched independent and switched to Democrat, annihilated him. And we did this by flipping the Hispanic vote. He got 70% of the Hispanic vote. That's unheard of for any Republican. So people are saying, you know, he's the future, he's the president, he's going to be the next president.
but we have a deep bench. We have, you know, unlike the, the Democrats, they're, they're probably going to run Biden again or maybe Hillary because their bench is so weak. <laughs> they, they have nobody. We have a deep bench. So we have DeSantis. He can go around the country and say, I can do for you what I did for Florida. He's got a track record. Cut our taxes, and we have a $20 billion surplus. You go to these tax and spend states like New York, they, they're like at like a $20 billion deficit debt, and their taxes are sky high. You know, my family in New Jersey pays more for homeowners, their property taxes, than I do a mortgage every year, like triple what I pay. I mean, it's insane. And what do they get for it? Nothing. Crime. <laughs> um, so not only that, we need to win Nevada, Nevada and Arizona. He, DeSantis could show the roadmap in Nevada and Arizona how to get the Hispanic vote. And the way we get it is our values match them. We just never went after it. You go in there and explain to them the Democrats' extreme position on abortion, their socialistic views on business, their um, pro-gender, their, their transgender crap. Hispanics will vote with us every time. You just have to reach out and talk to them. And DeSantis knows how to talk to them. And he can he can put that roadmap around the country, especially Arizona and Nevada. But he's not the only one. You build upon what you have. So we have the Hispanic vote coming our way. We also have the suburban vote. Glenn Youngkin had the biggest upset in Virginia last year because he got the suburban woman vote. He got the soccer mom vote because he, sh he knew what was important to him. What goes on in the schools? What the Democrats want in our school is drag queen teachers in, in kindergarten. And that's not even hyperbole. This is for real. And they know it because of the pandemic. They were able to watch it with Zoom. So Glenn Youngkin would be another great candidate. He would get that suburban vote. He would get that independent vote. And us conservatives love him too. So he'd be another great candidate. Tim Scott, solid conservative African-American. He would help take that 30% that... That the Santas, that uh, Republicans got, and bring it up to maybe fifty percent. That would it. That would end the Democrat Party. You know, Christy Nome, very successful. She's as successful in South Dakota as DeSantis was in um, Florida. And this is what people want. They want to see competence. They want to see results. And she, another great conservative that showed results, Christy Nome, and she would also she also is very attractive to the soccer mom. She would get that vote. But don't count out Donald Trump. Donald Trump changed politics. He made the Republican Party a blue-collar party. So if you're wondering what my expertise are, it's my party. <laughs> the blue-collar worker is what makes up the majority of the Republican Party now. So he brought us in. I mean, I've always been a Republican, but I know a lot of my friends that were Democrats, a lot of my friends that didn't even vote. But Donald Trump brought us in. And don't count them out. They want to, you know, the media wants to point out all the races he lost. But out of all the endorsed candidates that Trump endorsed, 216 won on Tuesday, only 19 lost. That's not a bad, that's not a bad record. And they were all overspent because McConnell hates Trump, so he didn't back them up. So if McConnell was backing these guys, who knows? You know, he might have had a better record. Plus, a lot of people ain't talking about this. Trump actually got more votes in Florida than DeSantis did. So in 2020, Trump got more votes than DeSantis did the other day. So don't count Trump out. But any combination of that, you know, we can't have DeSantis and Trump on the same ticket because if two people from the same state are vice president and president, you lose those electoral votes. It's in the, you know, that's, that's the Constitution. So we couldn't have those two. But any other combination, um, DeSantis and Noam, DeSantis and Scott, DeSantis and Yunkin, Trump and Scott. Trump and Noam, Trump and Yunkin. I mean, we have so many ways we can win in 2024. And in addition to winning the presidency, you know, I didn't want to discourage people, but this was a hard map for Republicans to win the Senate from day one. We were defending way more seats in the Senate than the uh, Democrats. So what I'm saying is we had a lot more to lose. They didn't have that much to lose. They were trying to steal from us, you know, win seats back from us. So we had a lot more to defend. So they had the advantage, really, in the Senate this time. But in 2024, there's 33 seats up for re-election, and 23 of them are Democrats. And eight of those seats are in Trump country. So we're going to pick off a lot more in 2024. 
I think we could actually get to a 60 vote uh, filibuster in the Senate in 2024. And I know a lot of my friends are saying, oh, Trump just needs to sit out. He's going to, you know, he's going to just fracture it. No, no, no. The Bible says this. Men sharpen men like iron sharpens iron. Give me a strong, brutal primary any day. Because then we'll see what these guys are made of. If DeSantis can't beat off Trump, how's he going to beat off the Democrats? You know what I'm saying? We need to go hard, fair and square. I don't want to see dirty tricks on each other like the Democrats do, but fair and square. But tough, hard primary. I want to see a brutal primary. And whoever's standing, that's the guy I'm going to vote for. A woman I'm going to vote for at the end. So be encouraged, guys. Let's make sure I didn't forget anything. I probably did, but <laughs> half of what I wrote, I can't, I can't even read. Because uh, I just write, you know, I write like a third grader. If there's ever a show, can you write better than a third grader? I will not go on it because I will lose. <laughs> but, uh, but there's good news. There's good news. We won the House. Looks like we're going to win the Senate. So that'll stop this extreme agenda. That'll stop any judges from going to the Supreme Court for two years. We'll stop them. And then in two years, we'll have, a, we'll have that. We'll have the House and the Senate plus a Republican president and maybe a filibrew. So the Republic is safe. The Republic, the future of America is bright. Don't let people discourage you. But even if we lost, man, we're Catholics. We belong to the one holy Catholic apostolic church. We belong to the church that Jesus Christ himself established and said the gates of hell will not prevail. Brothers and sisters, how awesome is that? You know, this has been said before by other people, but I'll say it again because it, it's so awesome. Nero couldn't defeat the church. Diocletian couldn't defeat the church. Karl Marx couldn't defeat the church. Communism couldn't defeat the church. Socialism couldn't defeat the church. The Democrat Party will not stop our church. Our church is older than the oldest government in the world. 2,000 years, and we just keep growing. From 2010 to 2020, we went from 1.2 billion members to 1.3 billion members. So God bless and stay Catholic.